Okay, we're wrapping up chapter seven, work and energy, and I'd like to go over a few application problems. We like to see how what we're learning applies to the real world. We'll start with a ski lift. We'll start with a ski lift problem. How much power does it take to operate a ski lift? Well, we have four people per chair. We have five chairs going up the hill. Each chair weighs 150 pounds. And we have to allow for the maximum load of 250 pounds for each person. Now, it's not likely you're going to get that many people on here that weigh that much, but engineers have to think about an upper limit. The chairs are going to bring everybody up 200 feet in one minute. How do we do the power? It's work for time. We need the total weight times the height. And it's just like running up the stairs. I get 5,000 pounds times 200 feet divided by 60 seconds. And I know what you're thinking. 5,000 pounds, that doesn't include the weight of the chairs. And it shouldn't because the chairs don't get off at the top. The chairs come back down on the other side. So it cancels out. We get 16,670 pound feet per second or about 30.3 horsepower. Now, how did I get the horsepower? One horsepower is 550 foot pounds per second. And now what if I told you that the system was only 50% efficient? How big of a motor would you need? You'd have to double it so that when you take 50% of that power, you get the power required to raise everybody up. So when you go on a ski trip, you go think about this. You could actually time yourself going up the lift and count the number of chairs and estimate the power required to run the lift. Then you can go look it up or ask an operator how big the motor is. Here's another example, hydroelectric power plants. We have a dam that backs up the water. We have a height of 20 meters and the water flows down a tube. It goes through this generator here, turbine with fan blades. And as the water flows out, we can see that we have a flow rate of 300 cubic meters per second. Now the velocity is gonna be constant throughout all of this because the water backs up into the tube and it drains at a constant velocity. So we're not gaining kinetic energy, we're losing potential energy and it's turning into electrical power. So how much power could this generate? We need the work per time. It's the weight times the height in a problem like this. This is the reverse of us running up the stairs. Now the water is coming down. Gravity is what's supplying the power. Well, to get the weight, we need to know that one cubic meter of water equals a thousand kilograms. So we can take 300 cubic meters times a thousand kilograms per cubic meter times 9.8 meters per second squared and we get 2,940,000 newtons. Take this weight, multiply by 20 meters, and ask yourself, what time does this occur in? The flow rate is given at 300 cubic meters per second. It takes one second for this much weight to push through that generator. So we just put in one second, and that's 58.8 megawatts. That's million for mega. Now there's plenty of hydroelectric power plants like this around the country. And some of them are that small. That's actually small. A lot of them are bigger. My brother works at a nuclear power plant in Texas that has an output of one gigawatt. That's a billion watts. Now you can go on a field trip to see one of these things. You can drive up to the Great Falls in Patterson, New Jersey. It's a national historic landmark. And there's a statue there of Alexander Hamilton. He first went to see these waterfalls and he said that this is where the Industrial Revolution will take place. And boy, was he right. Of course, you can head up to Niagara Falls and see a huge power plant. You can actually get a tour and go inside it. And on the American side, there's a statue of Nikola Tesla. Think about that one. Here's a problem from the auto shop. You need to set up some pulleys so that you can lift an engine. It weighs 400 pounds. Now, how are you going to do that? Let's say we put the rope like this, and we have to ask ourselves, how much force would we need to pull with? 
there's two strands. If it's ideal and that's 400 pounds, we would have to pull with 200 pounds. But is this the best way to set this pulley up? You'd be better off pulling down than pulling up. Now you could use your body weight and help pull the thing down. You see, that's the difference between just doing problems on paper and actually trying something in real life. Now how hard would you have to pull? You gotta count the number of supporting strands that are attached to the bottom what you're trying to lift. This does not count as one of them. They're, that thing is not attached to the block. So you'd have to pull with 100 pounds. So let's say you wanted the engine to go up three feet. How far would you have to pull your hand? In an ideal situation, you could say FEDE equals FRDR. Do the math and you get 12 feet. So remember, you're getting to use less force, but more distance. So what's the IMA? Make sure you count the ropes holding up the block. We get four. Now what's the force on the ceiling? This, all of this has to be supported by something up here. Now you have to count the number of ropes that are pulling down on the ceiling. Now this counts because it's pulling down. There's five of them. So it's 500 pounds. Just remember what we learned about tension with pulleys. It's the same on each strand if it's frictionless. Now, what if a car is in the way and I can't pull straight down? Hey, maybe I could run the rope over to another pulley that's fixed to the ceiling and now pull down over here. Does that change this force? Think about this rule. The tension is the same on each side of the frictionless pulley. So whatever the tension is in here, it's the same up here, it's the same over here. So it's still 100 pounds. But what if we do have friction? And it turns out I have to pull with 120 pounds. Can you calculate the actual mechanical advantage? So we get the FR over the FE. This is how much stronger the machine makes us. We get 400 pounds over 120 pounds for a 3.33 actual mechanical advantage. Does that change how far we have to pull the rope? It's still the same distance. The friction doesn't change the length of the rope. You don't believe me? Go back and look at the pulley. If the pulley rises three feet, then there's one, two, three, four strands that disappear three feet long each. They all gotta come out on that side. So what's the work in? Take the FE times the DE, and you get 1,440 foot-pounds. What's the work out? 1,200 foot-pounds. 400 pounds times 3 feet. What's the waste heat? 240 foot-pounds. How do you calculate the percent efficiency? Work out over work in, and it's about 83%. Yeah, it's in time for another field trip. Go down to the auto shop and watch them do this. They actually have a little crane with pulleys on it, and you can pull on the chain and lift an engine. Here's another great application. Stopping distance for a car. Pay attention, it could be you in the car. We've got a car with 2,400 kilogram mass, moving initially at 15 meters per second. All of a sudden, you gotta slam on the brakes. How quickly can you stop without skidding? Well, if we're not gonna skid, we need to know the mu s. Let's make it 0.9. Everybody should understand that the final velocity is going to be zero. We could start with our full energy statement. Am I doing any work to this object? No. Does it have any kinetic energy initially? Yeah, it's got a velocity, it's got a mass. Does it have any potential energy initial? No, it does not. Does it have any kinetic or potential energy at the end? No, it's coming to a stop and it's still at the same height. So the only thing we've got left is waste heat. So we can see that the kinetic energy is turning into waste heat. So we have 270,000 joules. Now to get the distance, we need to know the force of friction static maximum. The force of friction static maximum is mu s times fn. And we get 21,168 newtons. So what's that distance? And we get 12.8 meters. Now that's really ideal because that does not include your reaction time 
and that's a pretty high coefficient. Um, I gotta tell you, at 15 meters per second, that's about 34 miles per hour. In real life, that distance will be about double that. And a good portion of that is because of your reaction time. Well, what if we went to 30 meters per second? What if we doubled this speed? Now we're talking, we're going over 60 miles an hour. What's gonna happen to your stopping distance? Do you think it will be double this? Look at the formulas down here. Nothing changes except that velocity. If you double the velocity, how much kinetic energy will you have? You're gonna have four times the kinetic energy. Will your force of friction be any different? That depends on the mu and the Fn. That hasn't changed. So what's gonna to happen to your stopping distance? It's also gonna be about four times. So even though you're only going twice as fast, you need to allow for four times the distance to stop. And that does not include the reaction time. So think about this the next time you go drive your car. Now why don't you go back and watch the other videos and you'll see more examples.